I hope you had some rest after these amazing uh, presentations. And right now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Mabel Moraña, who is William H. Gass Professor in Arts and Sciences at Washington University in San Luis. She's our keynote speaker. And Professor Moraña really doesn't need an introduction for those of us who do culture, uh, cultural studies, um, but also for Latin Americanists. Uh, Mabel Moraña has been a leader in raising intellectual debate and discussion and advocacy and on in Latin America and the Caribbean studies from a Latin American perspective by generating and disseminating academic research, public engagement as director of Latin American studies, first as the, at the University of Pittsburgh and now at Washington University in San Luis. Professor Moraña um, has a wide, well-read work uh, that touches many fields, topics, and periods, from the colonial times to the present, from the Baroque to nationhood to modernity, from cultural criticism and theory to contemporary Latin American post-colonial studies, intellectual history, gender and violence, among other subjects. She's the author of many books, including Arguedas, Vargas Llosa, Dilemas y Ensamblajes, La Escritura del Límite, Crítica Impura, Viaje al Silencio, Exploraciones del Discurso Barroco, Políticas de la Escritura en América Latina, among many others. I don't want to read, you know, because you want to hear her, her um, talk. Uh, on the topic of um, water, Professor Moraña has uh, opened up perspectives on what we call in cultural criticism, hydrocriticism. Um, her edited volume, Hydrocriticism and Colonialism in Latin America, is organized around the critical and theoretical turn known as hydrocriticism, an innovative approach to the study of the ways in which bodies of water, oceans, seas, rivers, archipelagos, lakes, impact the study of history, culture, and society. So I welcome Mabel and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you to Adela Pineda and to uh, Carlos uh, uh, Ramos Charron uh, for this invitation. It's an honor for me to be here. And I thank you for your presence uh, here. I'm going to read a presentation in three parts. Uh, the first and the third are brief, uh, briefer than the, the center one, uh, trying to give an all encompassing or at least an ample uh, perspective on the topic of water from different perspectives. Just to open up uh, you know, the field as much as we can in order to welcome some reflections about the significance of this element uh, at a cultural and political level. Uh, my title is The Politics and Epistemology of Water, Notes on the Hydrocritical Approach. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead with the first uh, part of the reading. Very few topics uh, would be able to compete with that of water for the sheer number of meanings, uses, symbolisms, and interpretations. Even less could be found as frequently at the center of political and economic developments as the nucleus of international disputes as, and as the medium through which colonial domination has been and continues to be implemented. Bodies of water have been traditionally used as international or regional borders, as channels of communication, and as routes for commercial exchange and human mobilization. Oceans, rivers, and lakes have constituted enormous challenges for projects of exploration, irrigation, and technological applications, and have nurtured literally and symbolically innumerable societies and cultures. Consider the transitional state between fire and air, 
between the vaporous nature of our ethereal surroundings and the solidity of Earth, and by extension between life and death, water has been assimilated to maternal attributes related to fluidity, milk and blood, fertility and nutrition, spirituality and physicality. In his study of symbols, uh, J. E. Silot indicates that, and I quote, whatever uh, water symbolizes terrestrial and natural life, uh, never metaphysical life. However, end of quote, uh, however the presence of water in baptisms, um, ablutions, holy ceremonies that prepare the corpses to be buried and other rituals confirms that this element always plays a cleansing and purifying role related to the passage from earthly existence to the afterlife. Essential primeval and omnipresence, uh, omnipresent, uh, at least in our world and our bodies, water is also a constant element in collective imaginaries. In Egyptian and Chinese civil civilizations, in the Hermetic tradition, in India as well as the pre-Hispanic cultures of the so-called New World, water has always played a key role as the elemental substance from which life emerged and through which life is preserved and reproduced. Incas, Mayas, and Aztecs, as we heard before from uh, about Maya from Professor uh, uh, La Lazarde, uh, Lazarde. yes, uh, administered the gathering, channel, channeling, and circulation of water with methods that even today are considered examples of sophisticated hydraulic engineering and architecture applied to the construction of water dams, aqueducts, terrazas, meaning multi-level agricultural arrangements, irrigation ditches and drains. Quichua's uh, thought of water as a living being whose regular action on the earth allowed for the renovation of life and the sustainability of harmony between all living species and the natural environment. This holistic conception didn't distinguish between culture and nature as different, as different and even less as opposing domains. In the Caribbean archipelagic geography, wa water connects and divides islands and continental lands, but as importantly, constitutes an ever-present component of spirituality. African diasporic religions in the region include water as an essential element that symbolizes life and unity. Jemaja, deity of water in the Yoruba tradition, often depicted as a mermaid, is also found with variations in Candomblé and Umbanda religions in Brazil, as well as in Haitian eh, voodoo and Cuban Santeria, where water is present as an element of purification and celebration of the divinities that inhabit rivers, lakes, and oceanic extensions. In spite of the universal recognition of the crucial uh, material and symbolic relevance of water in all aspects of planetary life, its scarcity due to its natural uneven distribution and or to the effects of human interventions constitutes one of the most dramatic problems of our time currently aggravated by the environmental impact of political deregulations. In Peru, just to give an example, the Andean project of farm technologies is currently facing the problem of what they call water refugees, that is of internal migrations due to the lack of water for agriculture and even for daily use in certain areas of the country. Officials indicate, and I quote, that the problem is not water scarcity, but nature's poor distribution. More than two thirds of the country's 29 million people live on the dry western side of the Andes, where less than 2% of the country's water flows, while only one fourth live in Amazonia, which can get more than 80 inches of rain per year. End of quote. These situations show that for modern culture, particularly in the developed world, 
Water has a mainly political and economic significance that in many ways obliterates its spiritual and poetic connotations. It is viewed above all as a substance of chemical composition and physical properties open to innumerable applications and consequently object of exploitation, legitimate and illegitimate appropriation, speculation and negotiation. For this reason, many strategies are used for the manipulation of the environment in order to control rain precipitations, avoid floodings, relocate icebergs in arid regions, uh, purify seawater to make it drinkable, construct reservoirs, redirect rivers, and the like. All of this points to the biopolitical repercussions of power struggles over natural resources and sheds light on the negligent processes of proposal, approval, and implementation of environmental law. That would end the first part. The introductory cultural and political aspects exposed so far situate the topic of water in the crossroads of numerous disciplinary fields that expanded their scope in the context of globalization. The intensification of necropolitics and the restructured power relations at transnational levels have not only transformed the political and economic scenarios of modernity, they have also incorporated with renovated strength urgent issues related in most cases to marginal territories and societies in which survival is still a daily struggle. The so-called new disorder uh, that emerged with the end of the Cold War triggered massive migrations across, across the globe. To a great extent, diasporas are the correlate of ecological crisis, environmental mismanagement, and reluctance to recognize the effects of inequality that uh, Professor Metcalf um, referred to uh, a moment ago. But if the political, economic, and cultural centrality of water is self-evident at so many levels, in recent decades, a relatively new theoretical direction has been focusing on water from a different perspective. I would like to concentrate the remaining time, or at least part of the remaining time to, of this presentation to the critical perspective of hydrocriticism which constitutes the theme of a collective book I coordinated, recently published by Paul Greg Macmillan, under the title of Hydrocriticism and Latin America Water Maps. And I'm going to circulate it uh, so you can see, um, you know, the topics that the contributors to the book uh, touched on, and you know, more or less the orientation, the theoretical orientation of the book. Due to time limits, I will focus mainly on the political and ideological connotations of water with specific reference to hydrocolonialism, a field that, according to Isabel Hofmeyer, the author of Dockside Reading, Hydrocolonialism and the Custom House, published in 2022, um, this new field, um, uh, says um, Hofmeyer, uh, could include, uh, and I quote, Colonization by way of water, for instance, mar uh, maritime, uh, maritime uh, uh, imperialism, or colonization of water, for instance, occupation of lands with water resources, declaration of territorial waters, or militarization of oceans. Also colonies on or in water, for instance, ships as miniature colonies or as uh, penal penal uh, uh, islands, uh, also colonization through water, uh, for instance, the flooding of occupied lands, etc. End of quote. Hofmeyer indicates that from the perspective of hydrocriticism, the separation of water and land only exists in the imagination, since both domains sustain each other environmentally and socially, thus constituted an amphibious independent totality. Obviously, the understanding of bodies of water and their material and symbolic significance has changed over the years in close correlation to the advancement of scientific knowledge, eh, but also linked to cultural interpretations, religious beliefs, and ways of life that understand the connection of peoples and seas in different ways. Uh, 
Lindsay Stark's uh, book uh, titled Encounter, Encountering Water in Early Modern Europe and Beyond, Redefining the Universe Through Natural Philosophy, Religious Reformations, and Sea Voyaging, published in 2020, provides an extensive analysis of the environmental connections between land and the oceans and their representation in the Bible, among the Greeks, and in the Renaissance. Expansionism, explorations, and the development of mercantilism characterize a world in which previous figurations of time and space radically changed. Particularly after the 16th and the 17th centuries, human mobility increased and diversified, covering unseen trajectories on land and sea. And sea. Ports and coastal areas intensify their relevance and magnetism as much for merchants and scientific travelers as for religious and political officials. Concurrently, foreign fleets, pirates, smugglers, and buccaneers populated oceanic waters, adding a dose of danger and uncertainty to the natural risks of nautical endeavors. Since then, the sea was rediscovered multiple times from very different perspectives, depending on the provenance of the protagonists and the goals they pursued. To give just one example, the image and significance of the Atlantic Ocean were, was redefined multiple times, identifying it as the Black Atlantic, the Jewish Atlantic, the Catholic Atlantic, the British Atlantic, the Atlantic of the slaves, the missionaries, and the entrepreneurs. Also, the vision of the sea changed according to the positionality of the subject. Colonizing cultures interpreted the ocean as a final frontier that, with the help of God and the leading forces of the monarchy and the church, could be conquered and appropriated. For religious purposes, the ocean constituted a challenge, a, a, a challenge for the expansion of Christianity, a new version of the Holy War now turned into a transcontinental endeavor. The image of the castaway and the stowaway told a different story. They constituted for centuries allegorical representations of marginal human beings abandoned to the turbulence of life by divine, political, and natural forces. For the New World, crucial historical developments such as those of conquest, colonization, Christianization, enslavement, mercantilism, westernization, etc. later on modernization, republicanism, and so on, would be unthinkable without the comprehension of colonialism and the role of transatlantic ventures, trans-Pacific migrations, and inter-Caribbean fluxes of human beings, ideas, and commodities. The highly politicized dynamics uh, these highly politicized dynamics considerably enriches, in my opinion, the critical space opened by hydrocriticism by adding to the ontological reading of bodies of water the elements of economic interest and profit that were key for colonial expansion and also crucial for the early emergence of peripheral capitalism. At the same time, both the colonialist and the imperialist perspectives illuminate on the differential significance of water in a variety of geocultural and political contexts where strategic locations, modes of domination and forms of resistance shape environmental connections and collective subjectivities. Of course, in the context of the world wars, the oceans became battlefields and their significance changed depending on the political standpoint of the observer. In post-colonial times, the conceptual appropriation of the ocean is then inseparable from the notions of domination, submission, enslavement, territorial devastation, and genocide. For this reason, the ocean has always been approached with ambiguity and caution, thus becoming a source of anxiety and the inspiration of fantastic figurations. Hofmeier observes that in a post-colonial context, and I quote, land has been fabled both an, uh, as an automatic platform of knowledge and as a locus for the colonial 
an anti-colonial nation. The ocean, by contrast, has been forgotten, first by the emerging settler colonial nations attempting to erase its origin, and then by anti-colonial nationalism turning its back on the ocean as a source of imperialism." End of quote. However, in specific geocultural contexts, such as the Caribbean, uh, the relevance and um, omnipresence of the seas is an essential element for the understanding of both the history of the region and the configuration of collective imaginaries. In his classic book, The Repeating Island, The Caribbean and the Postmodern Perspective, published first in 1996 and in Spanish in 1989, Antonio Benitez Rojo emphasized the variegated nature of the region. He says, uh, he emphasizes, and I quote, its fragmentation, its instability, its recipro reciprocal isolation, its abruptness, its cultural heterogeneity, its lack of historiography and historical continuity, its contingency and impermanence, its syncretism, end of quote. According to this author, fragmentation incorporates the fluidity of meanings into the processes of knowledge acquisition, as if the liquid condition of the Caribbean uh, region had been interiorized in its history and its temperament. Cuban critic uh, and curator Ivan de la Nuez uh, in La Balsa Perpetua, Soledad y Conexiones de la Cultura Cubana, The Perpetual Boat, Loneliness and Connections in Cuban Culture, uh, written in 1998, refers to the constant flux of migrants that follow the implementation of the American blockade on Cuba, and that also resulted from internal social conditions such as repression of non-traditional sexualities and the like, uh, and the like which motivated the so-called exiles. Most recently, Yolanda Martinez San Miguel and Michelle Stephens have explored what they call contemporary archipelagic thinking in a book published in 2020, where the notion of archipelago expands as a productive metaphor of disciplinary formations. This perspective is, illus is illustrated by the image of apparently self-contained critical and theoretical approaches that, like the Antilles, they are isolated, isolated above, but connected below. Again, the configuration of the Caribbean uh, is seen as a crucial condition for the development of intellectual thinking about fragmented and unstable social and political realities. Mysterious and unpredictable, endowed at the same time with colossal material, aqueous force, an immense symbolic strength. Oceanic bodies of water <laughs> Oceanic bodies of water <laughs> communicate the notions uh, of monstrosity and sublimity, confronting humanity with the fragility of life. Uh, the incontrollable passage of time and the futility of earthly matters. Bodies of water define lifestyles, forms of settlement, physical displacements, commercial and cultural exchanges, as much as they influence attitudes, preferences, and activities. They also generate particular genres of writing, such as chronicles, diaries, lodge books, charts of navigation, maritime cartographies, and the like. So as scholars of maritime, eh, mar maritime eh, and oceanic studies eh, recognize seas and oceans are more than mere metaphors to express grandiosity, eh, fate, and passion, or to make reference to the notions of transcendence and eternal mobility. They possess a concrete material existence and an ontological dimension that requires an understanding of their particular epistemology. P 
Philip Steinberg and Kimberly Peters suggestively talk of wet ontologies, a concept that has both cognitive and methodological applications. For, uh, implications. Firstly, this notion allows to recognize the singularity of liquid perspectives and to theorize change and mobility as permanent qualities of living creatures and nature's intricate constituents. This meaning is the one appropriated and resignified by Sigmund Bauman in his well-known approach to liquid modernity and liquid time eh, and others, liquid fear, liquid love, etc where the author analyzes the effects of change, digital remoteness, anonymity of global systems, the loss of togetherness, etc., and emphasizes the need to rethink cognitive paradigms in order to capture the human condition in contemporary times. Secondly, and more importantly, the concept of wet ontology supports the attempt to destabilize the static, bordered, and linear framings that typify human geographical studies of place, territory, and time. Their perspectives seek to counterbalance the unidimensional notions of fixity and territoriality, thus overcoming the limitations embedded in that perspective of territorial control and land domination. An illustrative example of the benefits of a water-based analysis comes from the historical approach to, for instance, slave trade, an epic development of devastating consequences, almost always analyzed through documental sources that inform about the slaves' uh, hardships and dehumanizing treatments on land, with less attention to details related to their calamitous transoceanic journeys and to the feelings that the ocean itself inspired in captive individuals. In spite of the obvious predominance of land-based cultural analysis, it is important to mention in this rapid overview some influential works that focus on the impact of transoceanic encounters uh, on the formation of collective, uh, oh, oh, on the formation of collective, um, imaginaries and on the significance of maritime dimension, dimensions that show the limitations of national and nationalistic historiography. Edouard Glissant in Poetics of uh, Relation published in French in 1990 analyzes aspects of the transoceanic voyages of slaves, their conflictive figurations of the homeland and the feelings of objectification and existential uncertainty that dominated their life. For Glissant, the notion of antillanité derives from the mobility that finds in the constant variation of the ocean a new way to express temporality, identity, and space. Another remarkable work is, of course, Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness from 1993, where Paul Gilroy focuses on slaves diasporic displacement as a social formation in itself. Gilroy emphasizes the importance of social and cultural interactions that took place during hazardous transatlantic journeys, such as the so-called Middle Passage. In this sense, the British sociology sees the Black Atlantic, and he say, and I quote, as a counterculture of modernity. And also as a chronotope that provides new parameters for the study of reterritorialization and trans transcultural exchanges. Gilroy, Gil Gilroy explains, I have settled on the image of uh, ships in motion across the spaces between Europe, America, Africa, and the Caribbean as a central organizing symbol for this enterprise and as my starting point. The image of the ship a living microcultural, micropolitical system in motion is especially important for historical and theoretical reasons. Jules Deleuze and Felix Guattari also reinforced that idea, saying that the idea of the sea as a potential plane of eminence proposes the laboratory of another modernity, in which the hegemonic time and space of capital are viewed as cons, diverted, and subverted. 
Reinforcing this idea, British scholar Ian Chambers proposes in Mediterranean crossings the politics of interrupted modernity from 2008 that, and I quote, the centrality of the sea and the ship to the making of Occidental modernity propels us to set modernity on floating foundations. In this manner, the land and water dualistic approach is being replaced by a hybrid and fluid conception that better captures the dynamics of natural environments as well as the behavior of societies and the ups and downs of politics and economics. Traditionally, territorial stability has been seen as a principle of order and as the basis for the defense of privacy, property, and sovereignty. It has been also considered one of the pillars of individual and collective identity, a notion related to steadiness and permanence. Researchers that analyze oceanic environments from a sociological and epistemic perspective observe, however, that maritime regions transmit a different experience of time and space. This is one of the reasons why oceanic studies have been particularly welcomed by postmodern and postcolonial approaches, whose critique of identity politics, territoriality, and borderization have occupied the center of debates. But in some, if some theoretical perspectives emphasize the unifying quality of water and its life-supporting role, other, others also recognize the effects of the necropolitical manipulation of this element. Its fluidity is an inaccessible depth, its unrestricted movement, as a potentially political medium that can be used for the enforcement of territorial supremacy as part of the border delimitation between Mexico and the US, the Rio Bravo clearly illustrates this situation. In the same manner, the Mediterranean functions today as a cementary um, between Africa and Europe, tragically reversing the connecting and productive role of the Mare Nostrum. As Philip Steinberg it has indicated in The Social Construction of the Sea, a book of 2001, oceanic space can be as much as land, an arena of social conflict, thus shedding light on the other side of possible idealizations of the sea as an inherently free space. This side of the study on the role oceans play in contemporary life also reminds us of the processes of privatization ocean governance and militarization that have increased since the end of the Cold War, and also of the fact that seas still are racialized and colonized spaces. And this ends the second part of the presentation. Uh, to illustrate the racialized and colonized uh, condition of bodies of water I just referred to, particularly in maritime domains located in intercontinental and international spaces. I would like to make reference to some artistic projects that have managed to elaborate innovative, expressive uh, strategies um, of intense aesthetic and political value. I'm referring to the works of Claire, uh, Jason De Kerr's, uh, Taylor, a British um, sculptor, diving instructor, graffiti artist, photographer, and activist based in Puerto Morelos, Mexico. Since the first decade of this century, he undertook an impressive series of underwater projects in which the transitory nature of time and the challenges of constant aquatic movement constitute participating elements in the experience of art. In his first pr uh, project in 2006, um, his first project was the Underwater Sculpture Park off the coast of Grenada in the West Indies, recognized by the National Geographic as one of the top 25 wonders of the world. He's currently a artistic director of the Underwater Museum of Art in Mexico. And these are some of the, I can only show you uh, because of time uh, and, and because I, you know, it's just to illustrate the, the previous uh, concepts. Um, 
some of the pieces that compose that uh, uh, this uh, an underwater museum, uh, which now has different sites around the world. Uh, this is called the Dream Collector. These are sculptures that are uh, manufactured, uh, of course, in, in land and then submerged through a lot of um, uh, techniques. Uh, uh, but the quality, uh, the, the characteristic that these um, uh, sculptures have is that they, in, in, uh, in addition to the shape and the material, um, uh, the cars uh, has uh, attached or uh, embedded into the, um, the surface uh, elements that favor the um, uh, reproduction of certain species, uh, algae, uh, bio, bio what, bio no sé qué. Uh, yeah, corals and, and bio something, uh, you know, formations that really transform and contribute to the, um, uh, to the shape and the aspect and the function of these uh, objects. Here is the listener, is an um, oversized um, a figure covered by ears. And supposedly this is uh, one of the ways in which uh, this figure is trying to uh, capture the sounds and the presence and the afterlife of uh, migrants and uh, people who have um, ended up uh, at the end of the ocean. It's, it's, uh, in, in, in for the most part, is devoted to migrants who have succumbed to uh, the persecution of uh, from land. This is another one, an oversized uh, figure, already corroded, and, and you can see how the the work of the sea is adding elements to the to the construction. Here you have vicissitudes. All of these are people uh, from the coast, from the areas in which uh, the sculpture was working that were taken, uh, were uh, uh, functioning as models uh, for the construction of the body, the faces, and all that. This is, in a way, real people, right, that now see themselves represented underwater by these uh, um, intriguing figures and, and uh, constructions. Another one, the silent evolution. Features 450 statues of people in various positions. I would like to, uh, to show, to, to circulate this book uh, that gathers uh, more pictures than, than the ones I can show here. So you can have a, you know, a glimpse of the work of this very unusual and very striking author. You see here the corals and other, you know, uh, bioorganisms. I think that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> uh, that are, in a way, you know, adding to the sculpture and changing it and letting it, you know. Uh, um, express the passing of time and it's a different kind of life, right, because he's given to these figures. Another one, in this one the material uh, was prepared to let some kind of uh, musgo, I don't know what that is, algae or, or things grow and you know, in, in a few years, the, the figure would have a completely different aspect. You see here, divers uh, going around the figures that form a circle of figures on the floor and standing around. This is a, a another one, a let me com continue reading here because I don't remember all the information. Uh, but I say that uh, between 2006 and 2000, and, uh, I'm okay? Cinco minutos, yes. Um, 
2014, the caves submerged more than 500 sculptures, now, by now, many more in different parts of the world, and he described that as moments in passing or temporal encounters in which land and water converge, blah, 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 right? Um, I first, I wanna give credit uh, saying that I, I uh, first learned about this uh, sculpture from a, a professor uh, at the uni uh, Vanderbilt University who in a conference uh, titled Liquid uh, Borders, Migration and Resistance that I organized at, the, at Washington University, I'll let you see the book too because it has uh, interest for, the, for this topic. Um, Professor Michelle Murray presented some work uh, called The Raft of Lampedusa, which is this one, which was inspired uh, in, a, in a painting by Theodore Gerico of 1819, which is this one, the accumulation of bodies, the distress, the, the ocean, the, the loneliness and the danger, right? Uh, re-elaborated here and reproduced, uh, I think this is in the Mediterranean, in memory of African migrants. Uh, this is another one because uh, the Kairos uh, Taylor is not the only one who's doing this kind of aquatic uh, art. This is Adrian Morris, uh, this is a Greco-Roman warrior, huge, huge uh, dimensions. You can, you can see the diver here going around. Um, I don't know what the little, <laughs> the little toy is doing on top of it, but in next, another conference I'll let you know. And this is uh, another one, Nikolai Larsen, very good one, um, from Denmark, a visual anthropologist. And I'm only um, referring here to his work, End of Dreams, uh, I don't know if you can see all of these around here are a construction of corpses in body bags, right? Um, of course, there are not corpses inside, but this is, is simulating that. Uh, and he then uh, exposes them in, in a museum or something, and then he submerges them under a platform uh, to let the water uh, decay the material and harden the material too. Uh, if you can see here, this is the platform and the bodies are hanging underwater here and there are tourists on the platform, you know, uh, sunbathing right there. And then this is also another use of those elements that he has a uh, hang in a palace uh, in the uh, uh, Thessalo Thessaloniki Biennale in 2011. <clears throat> and I say that maybe no other image can be considered more iconic and disturbing than the photograph taken by Nilufer Demir of Syrian refugee Alan Kurdi, I'm sure you remember this image uh, taken in the, in the coast of Turkey in September 2015. Um, he was a victim of the destruction of a small and precarious boat in which 16 people, the boat was for eight, uh, were attempting to reach land in their search for an opportunity to survive. Alan's death uh, body lies between land and water showing transition and the complicity of both elements, illustrating the apocalyptic times in which we live and the deadly power of borders, privileges, and territoriality. That's all. Thank you very much.
interesting uh, the connection right, that, that you were making the, with, with the organization of the event itself, right? So, so yes. thank you for that. I was trying to show you that the fluidity between land and water, uh, uh, ways, ways to see, see you know, dynamics and hybridity, but particularly most, most of everything, the political side of it. Mm -hmm. You know, the way in which this hegemony of territoriality and land-based criteria has to be in many ways uh, thought of in a relative way, mm -hmm. right? Because water has its own epistemology, its own categories, its own language. And that's what I thought that this, uh, this uh, was, because nowadays, you know, the seas, particularly the Mediterranean, but also the Caribbean, underneath the water, there is, uh, you know, a testimonial, uh, a lot of testimonial elements of, you know, violence, uh, brutality, exclusion, marginalization, etc. I, I do have a question on that um, because I didn't know mm -hmm. there was a big sculpture, right? And maybe the, the question is an old one, right? The question is considering that the purpose of his work was what does he say is the purpose of his work, right? Because I see on the one side, this idea of bringing together culture and nature and you know, these bodies on the water becoming something else through the decay, not decay, but through the growth of life on them. But the, all the other, there are all these topics that are about the devastating uh, consequences of colonialism, modern colonialism, right? Who sees this work on the water? And why is the purpose of the artist of doing them on the water? Well, as, uh, as I said before, in which he shows that in museums, before submerging the pieces, uh, he makes all the communities participate in, in all the stages of the project. And he also, he's an environmentalist. Mm -hmm. So he wants to uh, raise a consciousness about the need to take care of the environment to create, uh, you mentioned corals, and that is ex exactly what he's trying to do. You know, the destruction of coral uh, colonies, uh, apparently for those people who study that is, is, is terrible and devastating. And he is trying to create mm -hmm. corals, arti in a way, not artificially, but to manage the process. So uh, there is an environmental agenda behind it, but also a political sensitivity in order to give a different kind of visibility to the problem as that not all violence is on land and we don't see everything. There are a lot underneath that we don't see. It's kind of a metaphor. What is the world hiding from our political consciousness, right? And the tourist on top and the dead submerged. Uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, it's a very suggestive way to make people rethink the environment and the political manipulation of it. That's the way I see it, right? Very interesting. Thank you so much, Madame. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm going to abuse of all of you. I, I, I would like to show you. Oh, my 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 this is a book that follows C. It's anonymous. So, so now we're going to break, and then we'll reconvene at 2.15 with the third panel on water in the 20th century. Thank you. Gracias, madam. Qué malo que no estaban los los biólogos marinos porque te dicen dicho exactamente lo que